Welcome to the Stare Ladies Podcast, where our mission is to get more people that look like us participating in the real estate industry. Whether you're a seasoned real estate pro or just starting out, there's something for everyone here. I'm Anita Wong. And I'm Tiffany Lee. We invite experts to not just talk about real estate, but also about our unique identity as Asian women and the cultural values that shape who we are as investors. Now let's get on with the show. The following is an important legal disclosure regarding the content of the Stare Ladies Podcast entertainment purposes only. The content provided in all episodes of the Sierra Ladies podcast, including discussions, opinions, interviews, and any other type of content, is intended solely for entertainment purposes. It should not be considered professional, financial, legal, or any other type of advice. No professional advice. The hosts, guests, and producers of the Sierra Ladies podcast are not professional advisors. The content provided should not be relied upon for making any personal, financial, or business decisions. We strongly encourage our listeners to seek advice from qualified professionals before making any decisions based on the content of this podcast. No liability. The creators, hosts, and producers of the Sierra Ladies podcast shall not be liable for any errors or omissions in the content provided, nor for any actions taken by any listener based on the information provided in the podcast. Any reliance you place on such information is therefore strictly at your own risk. No endorsement of investments. While we may discuss a range of topics, including investments and financial strategies, such discussions are for illustrative and entertainment purposes only. The Sierra Ladies podcast does not endorse or recommend any specific investments or financial products. Consult professionals. We strongly advise our listeners to consult with a qualified professional for advice tailored to their personal circumstances before making any investment or financial decisions. No association. There is no association between Sarah Ladies and a guest speaker or professional. By listening to the Sarah Ladies podcast, you acknowledge and agree to this disclaimer and understand that the content provided is not intended to replace professional advice. Now on to the show. Hey, Pod Squatters. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of the Sarah Ladies podcast. We're so excited to have our extremely accomplished friend here today, Rick Ku, CEO of Midas Wealth, it graced us again on our podcast. Now, if you haven't heard Rick, we just had him for our live event in New York on our wealth panel, which was recently aired on our podcast here. If you haven't heard it, the full episode is in our show notes. Amazing. So now as as much as we want to get into the nitty gritty finance tips and tricks, which Rick is a rock star at, you guys have to go to the last episode for that. Uh, we because because we literally could spend an entire month just picking rain, Rick's brain about all, all the nuances and ins and outs that people can do to build build wealth for their family and do well for themselves. Um, you know, we're, we're going to be talking about dynastic wealth and, and how we talk about wealth within our family. So this is more of a softer cultural discussion, more so a technical discussion. Uh, the technical discussion, you got to pay the big bucks for with Rick. Sorry. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, for, yeah. So he's, that's, a prof- <laughs> that's a professional consult. Uh, <laughs> so a bit more about Rick before we dive in. Rick Hugh is the founder CEO of Midas Wealth. He's a motivational and global speaker and a high performance coach. He's a Forbes top 100 financial security professional, award-winning wealth management advisor, million dollar round table lifetime member, and MDRT top of the table member. What's MDRT, Rick? I was uh, was curious. It stands for million dollar round table. Oh, so he said the same thing twice. So it's, um, it's a global organization that recognizes like the top percentage of like financial advisors in the world. Yeah. Oh, amazing. And now without further, you know, a fun fact about me and Rick, Anita, which we didn't uh, touch on. So uh, not only is Rick like a top, um, you know, financial advisor, he also went to one of the top high schools in the country as well. In the uh, world. In the world. No, it is. I think it's. You're right. It is in the world. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and I, I have, it's a coincidence that it's the same high school we both went to. We both <laughs> went to the same high school. That's, That's crazy. I do know that. This is really funny. Wait, Rick, what was Tiffany like in, was she also just a, was she a class clown, obviously? He wouldn't know. He was too cool to hang out with me. I wish I knew. I'm I'm like an old fart. So therefore, (laughs) by by the time uh, Tiffany, I think, joined the high school, I I already had graduated. No, you were a senior. I was a freshman. Oh, really? You didn't notice me, senpai. (laughs) (laughs) Not, not, not true at all. I, I was probably the one. Um, see, see, I, I was, I was at the same height in high school as I am now. You probably didn't notice me because you were most, most of the kids knew me in middle school. So that was probably it. All right. Well, that's funny. All right, let's jump into it. Let's, Got it. I don't all know right. where I would go, with that, but that was funny. <laughs> All right. right. Well, Rick, tell me, tell us about your family background and how wealth was taught to you growing up. That's a very easy question. Um, Wealth was really never taught growing up. In fact, I don't think it's still being taught by my other family members to 
to the younger generations. Uh, I think it, there's a um, stigma, especially amongst Asians when it comes to wealth, money and finances. But a little bit about our family background. Uh, my parents migrated from China in the 1970s. Uh, in the 1980s, they had me, their one and only child. Uh, my father and my mom was uh, extremely hardworking, very blue collar. In fact, my father was a, a chef at a restaurant. My mom was a cashier at a supermarket and they would work seven days a week. And I was raised by my grandmother and uh, in previous other podcasts or other presentations I've shared, I don't really know or recall much of my childhood because my childhood was really just repetition. I would go to school Monday through Friday. I would go to school, which is like normal school. And then Saturday, I would go to Chinese school. And Sunday, I would go to like, like test prep. Uh, not sure if it's because my parents like, man, my son is probably needs more education. Or they just needed a place to like park me until yeah. they come home from work, right? That was um, my parents. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, same. And, and um, it was never really taught. And I, I think even after graduating school, uh, my parents really never talked about financials until I approached them. And when I first approached my parents and my family members about wealth, uh, they were kind of like off guard. They, they, they made it, it was very uncomfortable for them. And coming from a younger generation to an older generation, it was almost to a point where they were curious on why I'm even asking these things. And it was, a, in my humble opinion, not really a healthy dynamic. Because yeah. although my parents and all our family members are older than us, they would talk down on us because we're younger, mm. which it's ironic because I was uh, one of the few, if not only at that time in our family members that actually had a college education. So they would ask me how to translate letters like mail, right? Yeah. That was English, but they would never take any of my advice. And yeah. uh, when I started approaching them about how they're handling their financials, I quickly realized that it was catastrophic and they were going down a, uh, a future that is not efficient. And then I slowly realized it wasn't just my parents, it's the majority of the Asian community. Um, so that's a little bit about my background and um, the conversation behind wealth with family. Yeah. So now like fast forward, you have a badass wife and three kids. Um, how do you explain the concept of wealth to your kids now and I will have some of your learnings from your past translated have, are being translated or not being translated. Sure. It's almost like the complete opposite of my childhood. Mm -hmm. uh, people ask as a parent and, and as a spouse uh, to my wife, uh, what, what are things I hope to, and when it comes to having a family, I just want to raise my kids by being the parent that I wish I had growing up, which first and foremost was being present. I, I, Seeing my parents was a luxury, unfortunately. And I always say this, unfortunately, many of the more older school, traditional older generations, they're very generous, or maybe sometimes they're not, with money, but they're very, very cheap with time, right? Mm -hmm. they, don't, they, don't, they don't spend time with, with their loved ones, especially the younger generation. So for me, I, I, it's, uh, it's non-negotiable. Where Monday through Friday, I, I have work. And sometimes I take off of work for like important events, like uh, like a parent teacher's conference or my son's birthday at, at his school. But weekends are non-negotiable. It's family time. But I, I talk to my kids even at, at the young age of like five and three about money, about money. And I talk to my parents about money. In fact, my financials are so transparent <laughs> Where mm -hmm. even my coworkers, which my parents or people that I know, they're like in shock. My coworkers know how much I make. So like mm -hmm. if I hire someone on my team who's more of a senior level, executive level, managerial level, I show them my books. I show them my income. I show them my tax return. I show them everything about my family because I truly believe uh, in life is about transparency, communication, and education. There's really nothing to hide. There's nothing that I'm uncomfortable with. Um, and you, um, you, you guys may have heard me speak on podcasts and on stage. I talk about everything that I think is necessary because I don't think there's much that I need to hide or, or really keep inside because the lessons I've learned can be helpful for others. So to going back to when you were starting with your, so you started talking about wealth with your kids when they were three, 
Yeah. Right. So how did that conversation go? What was even happening? I, I, um, like wealth is a more complex word. I would teach them just money and how money works. Right. I said, I would explain to them, I say, Hey, Monday through Friday, daddy's at work. Do you know why daddy's at work? And they're like, no, they don't. So like, even at school, I think uh, um, one of the sessions was like on father's day, what is daddy's favorite thing to do work? What does daddy love to drink coffee? Right. Who do daddy love us family? Aww. Those are the things that I find are very important. So they understand that I only go to work because it's, it's, it's a passion of mine. I love what I do. I tell my kids now daddy goes to work because daddy's a superhero at work, right? I don't work because it's necessary financially for us. Fortunately, I do it because it's something that I'm super passionate about where I want my kids to grow up to be whatever they want. And I, I, I find it, um, whether it's almost 40 years ago when I was growing up or even today, too many parents try to control the lives of their kids. And respectfully, this is just my humble opinion. We shouldn't do that, right? We should raise children to be confident, to, to have courage and to be outspoken. Did you know, I, I read a lot of these studies, especially when my kids were much younger and, and every book have their own version of statistic and studies. Most kids, I believe personality traits are developed like over 80% by the age of 10. I'd be the first to raise my hand. You just can't see it because it blends in with the background, right? First to raise my hand, right? Up to 10 years old, my parents weren't there. My parents weren't there. So like, quite frankly, probably most of us that are listening or watching this can resonate like, man, up to 10 years old, how often were our parents around? Probably not much. And even today, like people like are, are my age, like almost 40 years old, our generation, you know what they do? They hire a nanny, right? Monday through Friday or Monday through Sunday and try to do all these parenting things by, by nanny. And, and I would say, yes, there are certain things that maybe having help would be necessary, but just that the time you spend with them, like probably the three most important words I say to my kids is I love you. I've said, I love you to my kids uh, more than my parents probably said to me in my lifetime. But back to your question, how do I teach them about money? I say, well, daddy goes to work um, so that daddy has a company uh, and, and to earn money. Now, what money is, and I show them money, right? Paper dollars. And I would just say, hey, money is a tool that is used really in uh, uh, two ways. One, it's an exchange for goods or service. Goods, for example, is like buying this hat, buying these clothes, buying the house that we live in, buying the food that my kids eat or the toys that they want. And two, is service, like my haircuts or service like nanny care and other care. But money should never be hoarded. Never be hoarded, right? Like it's useless. You don't eat money. You you don't you don't hoard it. You don't wear money. And then number two is, and and this is probably too young for me to teach them. It's just taking money. My my kids probably don't see the value in money like many of us as adults. They just have, hey, daddy, do you have a dollar? Daddy, I need to go uh, buy this candy, right? So they they instantly would choose candy over money. But us as adults, we started like worshiping money, which is sad in my opinion. Right. So it's either exchange for goods or service or number two, so multiply it. It's a multiply it. Right. So it's like, hey, taking your dollar and how can you grow it to two, to three, to ten dollars? Um, but what I teach my kids is like, especially my son who's six years old, it's like, daddy, I mean, he's into like Pokemon right now. So he wants me to buy him like this Pokemon like set, which is like, let's say a hundred bucks. I say, I say, Midas, how much is it? And he reads the numbers like a hundred dollars. I said, Midas, $100, that means daddy has to work a lot. Are you okay with daddy going to work a lot? He's like, no, daddy, I'd rather you be home. I'd rather you be home. I said, good. And then, um, and I said, well, here's the thing. How about this? You earned $100 through 100 stars. And people ask, like, what is 100 stars? And I recorded this. It's coming out soon on some of our social media platform. It's like every star, how he earns it is he wakes up on his own. He brushes teeth on his own. He picks out his clothes. Sometimes we make sure... Uh, we pick out the clothes, he gets dressed on his own, and he's breakfast, and he gets into the car ready to go to school on time, then he gets a star. And sometimes if he's late, or he's not really like uh, uh, following instructions, well, we may say, hey, Midas, today, it seems like you um, didn't follow, uh, make it to the car in time, you're gonna have to get a star taken away. He's like, yes, daddy, mommy, you're right. He gives us back a star. So I'm teaching him the importance of like earning and losing things. And I think it's really important, right? Because like, w regardless of whatever wealth his parents, which is us have, it's our wealth. 
If he shows me that he's responsible enough at the age where I'm ready to pass it to him, I will. But if he's not responsible with the wealth that eventually we try to pass to him as an inheritance, I will not. I'd rather give it all away to charity than to give it to people that are irresponsible. Um, but he's great. He's great. Like, like, and then I remember recently his birthday, I said, Midas, you get to pick one toy. He goes into a store and of course, like all kids, he's like, daddy, I want this. I want this. I want this. I was like, well, you have one toy. And he was like, okay. And he was like, but I really want it. I was like, well, Christmas around the corner, we'll come back and buy the second toy, right? It's very easy for me to buy him more toys. But if I don't teach him patience, if I don't teach him the importance that you don't get everything you want in life, just like we as adults don't get it, he'll never learn. But I then said, I was like, hey, Midas, I'll make a deal. I'll buy you every toy in the store. But for, in exchange for every toy in the store, Baba has to go to work for a very long time. I won't go. I, I'll have to go to work for 30 days. You won't see me for 30 days. Is that okay? He said, no, daddy, I want you. And that's what's very important. Now, unfortunately, our older generation, which is really sad, and I think about it, like, I wish I could go back in time, which I can't. None of us can. Like, my parents or many of our older generation will give as much money as possible in exchange for being mm -hmm. present with children. But, yeah. but what they do, which is different, is they give us the money in exchange for being present. But they never asked us, do we rather have money or have them present? Now, I'm asking my son, you want all the toys in the world? Sure, daddy will go to work. Or you had daddy here and you don't get all the toys in the world. And he says, daddy, I want you. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question of how I teach my kids the value of money, but the value of time and what is most important truly in life. No, and I love daddy. That. The answer is daddy. <laughs> daddy is the most Hopefully important. That's the answer. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, and that's, like, usually, that's what I was getting from I'll, the story. I'll, I'll, I'm like really, you guys, I'm, I'm like a 40 year old man and my father is in his like 60s. I still call like my coworkers and my, my friends laugh because whenever my parents come visit at our work event, I say, daddy, mommy. I call my dad and my mom, daddy. Oh my mommy. God. <laughs> I, I have no shame. I, I love the affection. Um, right? I still call my parents daddy, mommy. And, yeah. and I ask them, should I call them different, something else? And they're like, no, I love, they want me to call them the same way I used to call them when I was five years old. Yeah, and at the end yeah. of the day, you know, the one thing, and, and this is a Sarah subtle Asian real estate ladies podcast. The one thing that I believe Asians or too many people have or care more about the money, care more about the money, which is yes, in my yes. opinion, a fact is face, face. Mm. Do you know what that like, like face, like ego. Yep. Right. Mm. I don't care about any of that stuff. Like I would scream out like across the room, honey, to my wife. I don't, I don't feel bad. <laughs> like, oh, I love you. And they're like, oh, no shame. Cool. None of that. I love it. Um, I wanted to pick up something that you said earlier, and I really love that you are building at a really early age, like the relationship between money and time, right? Like I never, well, never was asked for anything. I mean, never, like no parent sought my, my, like, um, you know, my opinion in regards to like how, you know, how we would want to spend that time also never really understood um, until I was pretty, pretty much now. I mean, that it's like there's a relationship between money and time, right? It's like you have to be spent in working or you, you have to spend your time. Time, you can't get back, right? Time, money, you can get infinitely, but, but time, you cannot. And I, so I love that you're kind of building that from a really – early age and even just seeking permission from your kids who I think that if they knew that, that they knew that, um, you know, that, 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 that was the exchange, I think the answer would be so, so different. Right. Um, whereas I think with Asian family, I mean, maybe just in general, it's just the blanket statement is just a measurement of how much money. Right. And, uh, so yeah, I really love that a lot. Um, so I knew, um, for me, like, uh, growing up that, you know, I, I like you was never consulted for, I mean, as a kid, even, even well into my adulthood about our financial situation, didn't even, they would never talk about it with us. It was a really, really tight facade of like, these are adult matters. You just focus on studying, you know, and then also the same, it's just like, um, I think, um, I never, I never really knew my dad until I think well into middle school, be just because he was just traveling and working all the time. And I think it's like such an immigrant narrative, right? It's like they have to hustle and be all of this in order to even 
put, you know, to, to make ends meet. And, uh, you know, to, for my case, like afford, um, you know, like to, to live in a school district that would teach me properly, you know, or something like that. Right. And, and so like your babysitters, your parents were essentially the school system, your Chinese school system, or for my time, I went to church like five times, a five times a week, because that's just where it was just like free babysitting. I, I'm, I'm, I'm like, at this point, I'm convinced I went to church for like, for 10 years, because it was essentially free babysitting. But, <clears throat> but anyway, but like, you know, I think like, I didn't really get to know my parents for for some time, and I certainly did not get to know the financial our family's financial situation. And I'm also an only child, where it's like I knew eventually that it would have to fall on my shoulders that this is something I would probably eventually have to deal with. Right? It's like the filial piety, like we need to care for our parents. That's how we show honor, how we show honor back into in in our in our culture. So. Um, yeah, I guess like how do you talk about your specific financial situation um, to your family, and um, yeah, how do you teach about like what's valuable to your kids? I think it comes down to the communication aspect. I think like your parents, Anita, and my parents were we were both raised very similarly, and and I wouldn't be surprised if anyone that's listening or watching this, they're going to say, yeah, this resonates with my childhood. And this is a, uh, it's not just like our childhood upbringing. It's a systematic problem. I think it's what I call the minority curse. I think people find their own self-worth through like their title at work, their bank account, how much they make. And we need to change that. We need to change that. Uh, my, my, my parents, like growing up, it was at least you knew what school district was. My parents probably just decided to put up, live where the neighborhood we live is because it's close to the train station, so they get to get work early. But it was not a good neighborhood. I, I I I searched the school district I grew up in. It's like a one out of ten, and <laughs> and no wonder the real estate. Since you guys are real estate professionals, the real estate value is probably one of the slowest or the worst growing in all of New York City. It's Flatbush, Brooklyn. We lived in Flatbush, Brooklyn, which you know today um, we have real estate there. And I, I told my dad, Dad, you should sell it. And you know what he says, which. Is another problem. He's like, well, this is the first home I bought when I came to America. I was like, wow, there's so much meaning. And I was like, but dad, you should sell it. And he goes like, no, when I pass, this is going to go to you and my grandchildren so that you will remember what, what grandpa went through. I was like, no, as much as we will mourn for a long time, I'm going to sell it the following day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going there. Collect no rent. I'm no, not ruthless. <laughs> yeah, I'm just to clarify, this was not the same school that Brick and I went to. This is a different not, school. Not. This is not. <laughs> just just clear about name. Name. Definitely talk about high school. Uh, like um, right? And then I, yeah. I, I'm I'm ruthless in the sense where I'm just very transparent and honest. I'm not emotionally tied. And um, right, because the, the emotional aspect should be felt through our loving relationship with the people around us. But like assets to me, respectfully, like I, I look back and we all probably look back. And I even said this to like my wife and other friends of ours. When we were growing up at like five years old, like my son's age, some of us grew up in like not good neighbors. Some of us grew up like in a different environment, travel all the time. Did you ever think that you weren't living your best life? No, no. Right? But what you do notice is if your parents aren't there. What you do notice is if, quite frankly, you're put at church all the time. And in my case, if my parents knew church was free, they'd probably throw me in church too. <laughs> right? they, they, they threw me into a daycare, which was like the, the lowest cost daycare. And I was always the last child picked up. Right? Mm -hmm. And it was sad. Um, but I think when it comes to communication with my children, it actually started with my communication with my parents. Uh, as I gotten older, and I think uh, for many of us, I probably have difficulty speaking to our parents. But if you could unlock that puzzle, it would change your life. I remember in my late twenties, um, I had a very you know serious conversation with my father uh, because he was asking me just about like some things he was doing in real estate. And I said to him the truth: I said, "Dad, that's a terrible decision." And he took it like the wrong way. But it wasn't his fault; it was my fault. My delivery was wrong. Mm. Then we started having a, a longer conversation. It was the weekend and we spent hours talking in, on the couch. And then I asked him, dad, why do you think this way with money? And I realized like most of our older generations, 
that especially migrated to a different country, they have scarcity mentality, scarcity mentality. I said, dad, whatever trauma you went through when you were younger, it's gone. It's gone. But you don't need to work this hard. Dad, you probably like in Tiffany's world, a chip leader, a chip leader, right? Right. So I always say this and I've said this at other sessions in the game of poker. You can be either chip leader or you could be short stack. The problem is most Asians live life every single day as if they're short stack. But if they realize that indeed, in fact, they get a stress test, that they're a chip leader, then they know that everything extra is within their control. But I said, and then, and then we had a, such a heartfelt conversation where my father even cried to me. And there's, it's not a surprise because my father's father, my grandfather, you know, passed away lung cancer in 1997 when my father was 35 years old. So at the age of 35, my father didn't have a father figure. I'm 38 years old. I'm blessed. Hopefully we're all blessed to still have parents alive today. So I share with my dad. I said, dad, I'm more blessed than you because at my age, I still have you. But the problem is you're not present to teach me the things and you're not present to be communicating the things that are important. So we had such a heartfelt conversation, but I explained it to him in a way where it resonated. And we got really emotional. And that was probably one of the best moments of my adult child, adulthood. And then since then, my dad and I don't really have a father to son relationship, but something even better. We have like a best friend relationship, a best friend relationship. Like last night, as I was coming home from work, I was like, dad, why are you calling me blowing my phone? He was like, I have a question about my taxes at the end of the year. I was like, well, dad, you can leave me a voicemail. If I'm not picking up, I'm obviously busy. Then we started talking through it. And I was like, dad, that's a terrible decision. Here's why. He was like, what would you do if you were me? And after I explained it to him, he's like, okay, that makes a lot of sense. But please do it before December 31. Otherwise, it won't be effective this year. So like he's asking me questions and I ask him questions, right? So it's really about the communication. Um, I also believe that 80%, if not higher, of the financial decisions we make are more psychological. It's behavior finance. It's behavior finance. Really, really important. And because I have such a great relationship with my father, my son can see it. So he's going to have a great relationship with his father, which is me. But um, I, I think it comes down to communication, comes down to understanding the other party. And, and, and when, you're, when you're speaking to them, you have to also understand how can you speak and deliver in a, a message in a way where it resonates. And keeping it simple, right? Um, like speaking to you guys, which are much higher educated than my father, who just has a high school education from China, I have to communicate to him in a different way. Just like we work with clients that are in the 80s and 90s, and we work with clients that are in the 20s, generational differences matter. So those are things that I would say when it comes to teaching financials uh, and wealth. I love that. And I think um, I have a distinct memory of like the, the shift of when my parents started talking to me about finance, like seriously asking for my opinion. And it was like, it, it kind of took me by surprise, you know, it was like there was a transition moment that happened where, and, and I think it took me many years and the iceberg is still melting right now. You know, it's like that you are a little bit out of the lens of, you know, of your, your kid, you know, like you're just, you're, you're my son, you're my daughter. Um, and then transitioning into like, oh, you've learned a few things. I think your opinion matters. And I think a lot of that does have to do with like the communication style, right? And uh, <laughs> I don't know about you, but my parents are, my my Chinese parents are very abrasive, <laughs> you know, very like, you know, like I, it's like they do not hold nothing, nothing kind. <laughs> like there's no filtering <laughs> of words either. And so the communication style was like such a huge hurdle for, for us, right? It's like a where you're not just like assigning blame or uh, or or just like, you know, just like, oh, you're just a kid, you know, just like it's just sort of tossing someone to the side just based on their their age or things like that. Right. And so I, I, I like that. It's like a, it's about it, I like that you ha already had the lens of like like I, I spoke to him the wrong way, you know, like I spoke to him in a way that wasn't resonating with the way that he was raised or how he knew to have these conversations. And so you just kind of have to do it again, just try it again, you know, and I, uh, go ahead. I, I'm curious. And this question is for both of you. 
I want to hear what your guys' before and after approach was to these conversations with your parents. And what was that thing that clicked where you're like, oh, I need to adjust this the messaging this way so that it gets through to them. Because I'm sure there's a lot of, um, you know, kids listening to this right now that have aging parents where they're, they're still in that fog of like, I there's a cultural disparity of like, you guys were raised in the old country. I'm Asian American the way we're approaching things is different, but they haven't really cracked the code yet. And if they're still in the weeds with it individually with your guys' own experiences, what, what, how did you approach it before? And then how did you kind of become that turn on that empathetic chip where you're like, they're not going to change. So I have to make the adjustments so that this message can get through to them and gift it to them, you know, kindly and with love. So both of, both of you guys, what do you think? Sure. Anita, you want to go first or you want me? Yeah, go ahead. Rick. Sure. I think it's not what you say to your parents, it's the tonality and how you say it. Mm -hmm. Words matter, but it's how you deliver it. I want to hear it, Rick. So show me, you, show me an example. Show me, how, did, how did you say, how did you say, were you like dad before? And then you were like, daddy. Daddy. And no, it's, it's, I, 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 I would say it with more emphasis, like, uh, right. Tougher my dad, but I was like, yeah. mommy, mommy, please help. <laughs> right. Cause I'm mommy's little boy. But, um, I think when my dad shares with me feedback or my mom shares with me any feedback that I disagree with, I would go, uh, that's, that's, thank you for sharing with me your opinion. Uh, that's actually really good. If I may ask what, what, what came, why, why did you decide what you decided and how did you come to that conclusion? Uh, are you familiar with this area? And if we can brainstorm some other possible situations that may occur, are you aware of these things? Um, I, I probably, and this is a skill that I develop, fortunately or unfortunately with my parents, is based on my work, right? I, I have clients that are even older than my parents, and I'm so comfortable speaking to like 80, 90-year-old people that I'm able to now understand every generational communication style. It's like um, the language of what, what is it called? Love language. Everyone has a different love language. You heard of that? I think you're going to say code switching and then you went to love language. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, like, it's like a love yeah. language. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. it's, it's more or less um, when I do speak with my father, my mom, my, my mother, they, I, I talk in a different tonality. The delivery is really different, but I, I, I just explain to them. Like even when my father uh, recently, we're, we're getting into a real estate deal. And my father was like, hey, I want 100% of the deed to your name. And I said, well, dad, are you familiar with step up in basis? Have you consulted with your attorney? And are, are we aware of how this may apply to your lifetime gifting with your CPA? And he was like, I'm not. And I said, before you make this decision, I strongly advise you, even as I'm your son, that you want to put 100% of the deed under my name. I like you and I the attorney and the CPA to all get together and we'll confirm what's in your best interest. Because if you're not going to sell this in your lifetime, it may or may not make as much of an interest, um, a difference. But if you're looking to build wealth and you're going to leverage this and continue to build and buy more real estate, I don't want you to put this, this property gift to me at this moment. Um, and he really respected that. And I think, you know, when, when we're young, when we're young or whatever stage we are in our lives, younger people, I believe, care about the things they have. They're like, oh, look at, you know, the shirt I wear or, or the car I drive or the home I live in. But when you get older, truly as parents, you know what parents are most proud of? The children they have, the children. And Anita, your feedback earlier about how your parents are coming to you for advice, that simply means, and it's probably one of the highest, you know, honor you can have in any uh, Asian relationship with family, they're proud of you. They're proud yeah. of you. You've proven to them all the incredible actions you've taken in your life where they're so proud of you that now they're coming to you to consult you. But um, if someone that's trying to communicate care parents are always just like really like um, disruptive, a great aggressive, uh, tonality is disrespectful. And, and it's like, dad, mom, listen to me. You don't know any better because you, you weren't born here. You don't understand what we understand, then you know what? Is your parents wrong or is it really you, us, are us wrong? Because at the end of the day, in the future, I believe what comes around goes around and everything vice versa, right? My, my children might say that about me when I'm in my 60s, 70s and say, dad, you don't know anything. But in fact, it's just about 
you know, open communication is key. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I think tonality is a really big part of it. And I, and especially I'm Cantonese. So it's like a, it's a very, oh my gosh, it's like, you can be so dismissive so quickly. And like, it's so, it's just like, also like a lot of conversations start and end with just how cheap things are. You know, it's too cheap. It's too expensive. It, you know, it's I mean, like, it's too expensive most of the time. 99% of it is like the end answer. And then you kind of just call each other names, roll like like roll your eyes, and then walk off. You know, <laughs> it's like what what's your favorite uh, insult that your parents have said to you? <laughs> I can't. It's like a rainbow, and like it's like <laughs> rattle it's like, it off in Cantonese. It's no, like I, it's, in my ears now. Uh, I don't I don't know, but then it's I'm Cantonese. Uh, right. They call me they call me Chuk-sang, Chuk-sang, it's, which is bastard. That, that's like the name. Like it's like Chuk Sang. Bastard. It's like my whole childhood, I was a bastard until they, they, they called me by my real name. And I was like, oh, I've gotten promoted. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I Cantonese too. Yeah. yeah. I, I think it's just like, it's the can, like, Cantonese culture is so abrasive and like very dismissive in a way. And so it's like, it's so easy just to roll your eyes and then just walk off with an insult. But I think it took a bit of transformation to really understand and empathize like, okay, if you think that is too expensive. Tell me why. Like, tell me, give me a little bit more context. Let's walk, walk it back a little bit. And then, you know, I also then discovered, I mean, it was like an obvious answer, but I mean, like my, my, my dad was an entrepreneur, right? He worked in semiconductors. He was, he knew a lot about that kind of stuff. Right. And so I had to really prove my point. I had to really walk it out in a way that it's like, I have to explain to you my my personal reasons and thoughts about why I think this is a good investment option or, you know, and this is the reasons why it's not without risk, but explaining my thoughts behind it. And I think that kind of like touches base on what you said earlier, Rick, about like, like this money is ours. It's a collective. We we have it's I am the, like the parents. I'm the gatekeeper. But this is our collective money, right? And what I want for my kids to do is to be able to spend it wisely. And so I want to hear, like, I don't even care about the outcome. I just want to know that, you know, it's just like, I'm not going to blow in a Ferrari, like, you know, just just because. It's like, walk me through your thought process about why that makes sense to you. And then I can have some kind of trust to to hand this to you because I can't take it with me, right? This is all yours eventually. So it, I think it's like the walk, it's like explaining your concept um, and kind of taking a perspective of like, um, this is a collective, this is a collective effort. Um, and I think also to certain milestones also really unlock those things. Like when I graduated or I got married, those like those all kind of unlock certain things in their minds about like their own biases, right? Um, and because another thing is like I realize is that like there's a lot of wealth biases in the, in Asian culture, right? It's like the paying for cash for everything. <laughs> like I had to take forever to really unwind. I'm still unwinding it now about like, oh, you need to buy, like real estate is a thing to go into. Buying it with cash is the thing to do. I'm like, there's a lot of other options. <laughs> there's a lot of other, like, there's a lot of other vehicles that you can put into, like, you know. And so there are certain things that are measures of success, I think, in Asian culture that would be like, that they think is the way because they all they all talk amongst each other and, you know, that's a thing to do. But as you know, like as second generation or being really immersed in American culture and being college educated, you learn how to do things much more efficiently, much more, um, so much more efficiently, right? Um, but I think it's another step to um, convince your family or convince your parents that you, there are other options out there. Second question for you guys: Are your parents affectionate? Like, or like, do they give hugs and kisses? And is that something you want to do with your kids? If they're not, like, how is that? This is 
Bless. <laughs> I asked this. There's all right. So context, because what Anita said reminded me something about because we were talking about our dads um, and, and their attitudes and of, again, tone checking and these like little milestones that kind of trigger something in them of like a success marker. And and the reason why I ask if they're affectionate is because I grew up where my mom gave me and my brother hugs all the time and she would kiss us when we go to school. And dad was just like, uh, good job, pat you on the head. But he wouldn't like go out of your way, his way to like hug hug us or kiss us. And I remember distinctly like when I got my acceptance letter to college and I was like, hey dad, I got a full ride. I got a scholarship. Like you don't have to pay for anything. That was the first time he hugged me in like probably six, 17 years, 16 years. <laughs> what the <laughs> fuck? I was like, it's funny, but it's like kind of hilarious. It's like I, I got my dad to be affectionate because he didn't have to pay for college. <laughs> Well, how did you react to that? Were you more like angry that he never did? I wasn't, or, no, was I'm that, not or, angry. That so, or was that more like extra special for you? Because- it was so special, but this is like, this is how it's like Asian logic. It's like <laughs> strict dad approval. Like it, there, there was this Twitter that was like someone, this Asian kid was like, Hey daddy, I love you. And he's like, okay, bye. <laughs> like, yeah. So it was kind of like one of the, I, like you know your dads your dads love you but they're not gonna like be super affectionate and kissy kissy about it but I just re- think that was fun like I think I got a kiss on the cheek too for for uh, getting a free ride so and then and then like time for my brother to go to college and like it was it was funny because my brother was like a hardcore frat boy so like all the money that they saved on me getting a free ride just like cr- it was a wash it was a wash at the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> but my brother's doing very like you know my I love my brother he's doing very well for himself but college those, those were wild years it was looking dicey for him back then but you know it's funny like just because you do well in college doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna get you know I'm not I'm not a software engineer like rock star like my brother is and we never saw that coming when he was a frat boy and it's like it, it totally like you know yeah you know, our our roles I, I, I'm rattling on because of like a sibling thing but like I'm sure Rick you see it with your kids because I know you live with their own all like only children so you guys didn't have to brunt the comparison but maybe you guys did get compared with cousins and your parents kids and stuff like that's a whole other thing we can like do a deep dive into too but I know we're like running short on time already but yeah uh I, I thought I thought that was kind of funny but um, yeah to answer your question um is my parents were never affectionate to me uh-huh. uh, but I realized why they weren't which is probably why your dad's not affectionate to you is their parents, my grandparents, weren't affectionate to my parents. Mm, yeah, now, it's I, yeah, it's I, I could continue this trend, which which is why I grew up, and you've heard me say this on stages: introvert, uh, shy, awkward. I don't really approach people, and I'm really just like by myself because I'm only child, and I was always left by myself. But it was because I met my wife, who was raised by college-educated parents that went to UC Berkeley siblings that every year they went on family vacation and they're so affectionate to each other that as I saw their, my wife and her relationship with her family versus how I had my relationship with my family, I realized that life can be different, can be better. And it's up to me now with a choice. So how am I to my kids? Like uh, I, I kiss my kids, kids on the lips. Right. And, and then I, I started thinking to myself, like at what age will I stop kissing even my son or my daughters on the lips until it gets gross? Probably like, I don't know, like middle school or something. I don't know. <laughs> until they say daddy ill, right? But I just, this is so I, weird. I, I just know that I absolutely am comfortable to show affection and love to them, right? Because tomorrow is not promised. And if tomorrow I'm not here, I just want my children to remember me for all the memories I've given them. Like, right. There's a quote. And I always say this, Bruce Lee says this, don't give your children the things you never had. Instead, teach them things you were never taught. Give them the experiences you always wish you had. So as a parent today, I just want to give my children the, 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 the childhood upbringing that I wish I had. And seeing how confident my kids are, how they approach adults at six years old and four years old, spark a conversation, how happy they are and just how kind they are to not only themselves, but to others. It's so incredible to me. And I think that itself is more valuable any wealth out there. But I, because I have a good relationship with money, because I understand the difference between active income and passive income, Mm -hmm. and frankly, uh, with the passive income and all the things we're building, and I I value my time, that is the only thing I'm not generous with. So my time is extremely sacred, and my kids see it, 
Um, and that, that's how I, I plan to raise family and our, our generations. Yeah. I love that. I almost feel like that you, we talked about question number five, right? Like we skipped it. We got there. Uh, okay. So, you know, what? I'm going to ask the, this will be our last question since we're running short on time. So we were talking about, you know, fat, like what was the, the generational curse, Rick, that you brought up before? What, what was that in reference to? Cause this is a different one. This is the, this is in reference to the third generation curse where they say 90% of families lose their wealth by the third generation. And uh, we see a lot of ultra wealthy Americans, like white Americans, like Warren Buffett, who speak out against the dynastic, sorry, Anita, dynastic inheritance. <laughs> Anita was making fun of me because I could not pronounce this word, dynastic inheritance. And he, along with Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, are all donating the majority of their wealth to philanthropic. philanthropic oh my God. Anita, read the sentence. <laughs> I can't talk. Philanthropic causes. All right, they're going to donate to charity. A lot of rich guys want to donate to charity because they don't believe in <laughs> to, in giving their kids generational wealth. There, Anita, I did it the way you told me to do it because I can't pronounce words. Or, or like in Elon Musk's case, he's going to use his wealth to fund a colony on Mars. But, but Rick, what's your take on um, dynastic inheritance? And does it? Do you think it negatively impacts our heirs? And do you think it's relevant to families of an Asian culture? where we believe more in collective wealth building, passing down wealth, perhaps primarily through the males of the family. But I, I think that's, I think you're more like progressive than that because you got twin girls. So yeah. yeah. I think that the statistics you're sharing with yeah. me is definitely true and valid, especially with majority of families. But I don't know if you know the statistic, the average college student graduates in five and a half years in like undergrad. Um, and I'm not the best student, although Tiffany, you and I went to the same high school. I graduated undergrad in four years, right? So statistics are meant to be like followed or statistics are meant to be broken. Now, if we think about it, and there's a reason why first, second, and third generation, right, when it comes to wealth, usually the first generation, like my, I think about my grandfather, my grandparents' generation, they worked super hard. They came to America with dollars in their pocket, didn't speak a word of English. They worked really, really harsh physical labor work and and they never saw their children which are my parents generation and why did they do that is because they felt like they had a necessity to provide and then because they they gave up all their time to to gather very little any financials then they give it to my parents but my parents generation assuming if they did receive a large inheritance which they did not they're going to be a hybrid mode they're going to work work hard like their parents but they're also going to hopefully be smarter than their parents with money but the problem is they are a byproduct of what they learned from their parents. So the third generation, which in theory should be me, would just be like, I have no exposure to my parents. I, I, and, and I become rebellious. I hang out with the wrong crowd. And, and because my parents just keep giving me money in a form of affection and love, I'll just spend it all I, I, either out of no guidance or out of spite. And guess what? The third generation wastes all because we don't know what to do with all this money and we received it all without much effort. Now, I would just say if it's by the third generation, things are gone, then just always stay in the first and second generation. Be a hybrid. So like I like I'm the third generation uh, based on my family dynamic. But frankly, I, I, I see myself as like the second generation where I will work hard, but I will also be smart. And I'll also spend time with my family and my children. They're also going to be in that second generation where they're going to receive a lot, but they're not going to receive like everything. No nothing is all given to them. It's going to be earned. Um, and I think realistically, because Asians, they're, they're just conservative. They don't speak to their family in a, in a, uh, in an effective way, a form of communication. It's a hierarchy. And quite frankly, it's ageism. Like it's instant ageism. I'm older than you. I, you have to listen to me, which is I, another reason why I think it's also bad. And like this male and female dynamic where male or the providers female. I also think that's wrong. Like heck, my son can be a stay home father. My, my, my daughters can be the provider or vice versa. It doesn't matter. None of that matters because it's a team. Right. You don't know how many couples I meet, whether one spouse make more than the other. It's a competition. No, it's a team. But the point is, um, if you teach your children, your parents generation and your next generation, the, the relationship with money, the right relationship where they're not controlled by money, but instead we are in control because this is a tool that we have access to and we can utilize comfortably, abundantly, abundance mentality. 
I think it'll never run out. It'll never run out. So to me, I, and, and be careful of all these like ultra high net worth people. They're creating their own charitable foundation because there's a lot of tax benefit, right? A lot of like, a lot of high net worth people create their own foundation charity because they donate it. It's a tax deduction and they could take these deductions and do other things with it. But yeah, I probably, we, we donate to charity every year, but at the same time is, and I'll teach my kids how to utilize these funds. But I don't think, I don't think it'll ever run out if we spend more time in teaching uh, the educational aspect and the responsibility aspect of family. So yes, the third generation rule is probably true. If you do some statistical research, some people say the fourth generation, but those statistics will only apply if you let it apply to you. Love that answer. Okay, we're getting close on time, but I want you to answer these rapid fire questions because they're, you're someone I wanna hear go really quickly on these. So Anita, without further ado, let's go rapid fire. <laughs> okay, what is one thing a mentor or family member taught you that still resonates with you today? A family member that's taught me that still resonates with me today. Mm -hmm. um, um, because I was always by myself, I can't remember much of my family. <laughs> or just a mentor. A mentor it doesn't mentor. have to be a family member. Yeah. yeah. And, and I'll say this. Uh, I've had a lot of coaches and mentors in my life. Unfortunately, many of them have never connected well with me because it's just the effective ways of communication. But I guess um, what... The easiest, and this is not taught by my family, but it's probably by my Western up upbringing. It doesn't necessarily have to be work hard. It's work hard and work smart, but working smart is better than working hard. Okay. So there was a name I, I would assume was probably Bruce Lee then, Rick. <laughs> that's that's our every every Asian kid's mentor is Bruce Lee <laughs> for hard work. They, they, they took him away from us uh, too soon. Our, too soon. Hard work and discipline. Yeah. yeah, but it's just like like yeah. We all teach our children, our family members, our loved ones to work hard. But why don't we teach them work smart? But if I had to choose work hard or work smart, it's always working smart and work hard. Mm. Hey, um, name someone that is doing something awesome that everyone should know. I try to be always abundant and I think all of you are doing very well that everyone should know about the Sarah ladies. Everyone should know about Anita. Everyone should know about Tiffany and whoever's listening to this. Um, everyone should know about you. Know. <laughs> what? Yeah, no, I was saying everyone who's listening to this podcast knows about me. And our yeah. podcast. Great. And, if, and, if, and if you're listening to this podcast and saying, Oh, who should I know about? Why can't it be you? Why can't it be you? Everyone That's should know about you. Very motivational speaker, Rick, right here. That's where it's coming from. So positive. All right. Next one. Right. Yeah. Name a book that significantly changed your career. For all the people that are, are listening, watching, they should read The Psychology of Money by Morgan Herschel. It, I emphasize it a lot because it really talks about behavior finance. It talks about relationship with money. But the book that really changed the way I thought uh, really early in my financial career or journey in finance was uh, Think and Grow Rich. Think and Grow Rich. The book itself, in my opinion, talks more about habits, consistency, and abundant thinking. And I always teach my kids about dreaming. Dreaming, right? When we're young children, we can think anything's possible. Like we we jump off the like the playground and say we can fly. But as adults, we're taught, hey, you can't do that. There's limitations in life. So just dream. So Think and Grow Rich is a great book that allowed me to think abundantly. And sometimes, and most of the time today, when I'm with my coworkers and other colleagues and peers, they're like, man, you think so big. And I never thought that way until I read that book. Love it. Yeah. Okay. And then what is one habit they have in your daily routine that fundamentally changed who you are as a business person? Working out every day. Working out every single day. Every guy today has said that, Anita, that you're two for two. Like, what's the one habit? Yo, I, I lift, dude. Lift. Do you even lift? Bro? It is true, though. You know, I would say that. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I lift my body up when I wake up I'm out of bed. So I lift now. But working <laughs> out has, has absolutely changed my life. And people ask, like, when did you start working out? Actually, when I was failing in finance. So um, I used to, you know how, like, many of us, um, who we should be held most accountable to is really to ourselves. So earlier on in my career, my first six months, anyone that have listened, I was a, I wasn't a good financial advisor, not because I wasn't good at math, which I am really good at, or really good at what I do. All those accolades that I have today, it really started 
uh, I was still the same person. I was failing because I didn't really know how to unlock, unleash my greatest potential. But when I was when I did not have enough courage to keep promises to myself, guess what I would always do? I would just like, it's okay. So like most people, normal people, if they, let's say, have a goal and they fail their goal, they will actually punish themselves more, like eat unhealthy, eat ice cream or, or whatever it is. You see all this type of BS in society. So when I was younger, I was like, what is something I hate doing that I must do if I don't fit, fulfill what I needed to fulfill? I would work out. And when I go to gym, I actually hate cardio. So I would like run 5Ks every single day. And there was one year I used to weigh over 200 pounds. I lost like 40 pounds in like six months. And then after a while, and I kept hitting all my goals, I didn't have to go to gym anymore. I just was addic addicted and obsessed with going to gym. And I, I, and I felt that like, hey, it changed my life. So I said this to a business owner uh, recently. I said, you know, um, the food you put in your body and the, and the amount of uh, – the amount of care you put in yourself, like exercising, working out, it's it's worth so much, right? And I, I don't know who's listening to this. Let's say someone listening to this is an entrepreneur or or let's say someone making a hundred grand. Do you know that if you live one extra year, that means it's worth a hundred grand. And I know I don't know if these studies are true or false. They say for every one hour you work out, you live three hour longer. Right? Ah. Uh, every one hour you work out, you live three hour longer. And did you know if you put like some of these bad things in your body, like ve like vegetable oil? Like, I don't know, to me mentally, and this is, I used to love the junkiest type of food, but when I see it, there's a, there's a kid inside me like, oh, I want to eat it. But then the adult of me and, and because I love people more than I love myself or love my old self, I said, well, if I eat all that junky food, I'll die an hour earlier. So if, if I see like, like, I don't know, like potato chips, processed food, I love it. But if, if I mentally connect, hey, eating the bag of potato chip means I might die 15 minutes early and I don't get to spend with my kids and grandkids, I don't touch processed food. Like all the things I used to love eating today, I don't eat. So I know it's rapid fire, but um, <laughs> exercise can really change my life. And if I can live a year longer, it's worth millions and millions of dollars. And quite frankly, it's not even worth whatever monetary amount. It's absolutely priceless. So please mm -hmm. take care of our body. And the food in America, respectfully, you read the ingredients. And I'm not like those gurus on social media that read the ingredients. But when you actually start reading these ingredients, they're crap. Like, like Asia, like other countries' ingredients, same product, you'll notice, wait, how come in America there's like triple the amount of ingredients that I can't pronounce? But in other countries, the same product has half the crap ingredients because U.S. products, U.S. FDA or whoever is listening to this, it's a money system. I, they're putting all this crap in us. That's why with all the, I'm not going to go about diet, but the, the 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 exercise. I could talk on and on. This is another the, podcast. <laughs> and then for, so. us, for us, <laughs> for us as human beings, take good care of ourselves, right? You got to yeah. fill your own cup before you fill others. So working out has changed my life. I promise. Yeah, I, I really love that too. That you're saying it's like if you have if you're having with something if you're failing if you're something that you're really struggling with, meet your body first, right? Meet where you're like meet yourself with getting your body right getting your mind right and then heading into something else right it's i think that's i think there's something really profound about that too for sure there's a business owner we work with and recently like his business was was going through some turbulent changes and then i just said to him i was like hey let's go let's go on a workout let's let's work out let's let's run together and he was like why i was like because your mental mindset is all screwed up right now i need i look at your eyes and this is my superpower I have on average 10 meetings a day, 50 a week, 200 a month, 2,000 a year. I've had over 20,000 client meetings, engagement. After a while, you start realizing things. So when I look at someone in the eyes, I can literally, in my humble opinion, tell if they're full of energy or if they lack of energy. And I looked at his eyes. I was like, something's wrong in your life. Start telling me everything, personal, professional, financial, his company and everything. I said, let's just go do some workout. And the past few weeks, I put him on this workout challenge. And I'm not, I'm not like a personal coach. I said, every single morning, I want you to work out and then text me. I don't care if it's 10 jumping jacks. Text me. Text me these wins from now to the end of the year. And every single day, I was like, Do you, are you a liar? Are you going to break your promise to yourself and to me because we care about each other? It's like, no. Every single day, he's been texting me. He's been working out. And look, like I saw him recently in, in one of our meetings, and his eyes completely changed. And his life changed. So it's about commitment. It's about discipline. It's about feeling good. It's like taking care of your body, taking care of your mind, right? Those are really important. 
I love that. And you know what? You actually sent, you actually drove this home. I don't know if you realize you did this, but this is a full circle event tying it back to like what, how you were explaining money to Midas and having him establish those good habits. Like daddy is practicing what he preaches. If, if Midas is at the toy store asking you, Hey, how this, this Pokemon is a hundred dollars. That's a, that's a hundred dollars of time. The daddy is not spending with you. If you want this same with the food and the diet, like it's time is the, the ultimate unit that is priceless. We can always make more money. We can always do this, this, that, and what, whatever. So I think that, 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 you, that nailed the point home. Um, so gold star. Great job, Rick. <laughs> As an Asian getting a gold star. <laughs> oh my God. But, um, Time, time is the most valuable resource. And second to me, relationships, relationships, right? Money is, it's, it's, it's not, I don't even think money is in my top five. It's having relationships like this that will change your life. So having more time, having your health and knowing the right people, being surrounded by great people, it will, you'll live your most abundant and most fulfilling life. I promise. Awesome. And if people want to be, um, want some one-on-one -on -one time with your positivity, how do they reach out to you, Rick? How, do, how can they do that? Um, I'm not, uh, the best way, easiest way is I just started a social media page because I had a really good friend saying, Rick, the message you share, uh, can be shared with others. And I said, I don't really need to share this. And I, I'm a really private person. They, and then they said a word to me, but to me, I took it as your waste of talent. So I started a social media page, which is on Instagram. Yes, two years ago, I don't even know what Instagram was, but I have Instagram now, and it's um, the handle I believe is I am Rick Hugh. I A M as a Mary Rick Hugh, and ninety nine percent of the things I post are just mo motivation, positivity, and and mindset. And the reason why I did what I did was because when my kids grow up, and if they do go on social media, I just want, and if I'm not here in this world anymore. They can actually watch some of the content that their daddy created and they can remember all these positivity because I, I just want everyone, because if we live a life of abundance, love and kindness, this world, I think will be a better place for all of us. Aw, thanks, Rick. That's great. What a great way to end the show. I need a final so for Thank here. you. Thanks for taking the time. We ran over time, but this was all good stuff. My pleasure. My pleasure. Right. Thanks for listening. But before you go, we've got a quick, subtle Asian real estate update for you. Hey everyone, Michelle Ngo Wong from Lotus Rising here. I'm excited to tell you about our second Sarah Ladies and Lotus Rising retreat happening in Oahu, Hawaii. Join us February 1st, 2024 for an unforgettable four day weekend retreat dedicated to Asian women's wealth empowerment. Experience our brand new property secluded in paradise for an unforgettable adventure of self-discovery, wellness and wealth manifestation to kick off 2024 with your sorority sisters. Don't miss this transformative opportunity to rise to your best self. Spots are limited. Reserve your spot today. Thank you for tuning in to the Sarah Ladies podcast hosted by Anita Wong and Tiffany Lee. If you enjoyed our show, please leave us a review or follow Sarah Ladies on Spotify and Instagram. And also click on our show notes to subscribe to our newsletters to stay on top of our news and upcoming events. Until next time, pod squatters.